Welcome to another podcast episode of DIY Guitar Making. I also produce video episodes of DIY Guitar Making live in the workshop. To find both the podcasts and the videos all in one place, go to DIYGuitarMaking.com. You can even subscribe to the email list there to receive new episodes, both the videos and the podcasts, directly in your inbox as they come out. Again, that's DIYGuitarMaking.com. And with that, let's get to the show. Hey guys, so today I'm going to be talking about fretting. And I promise there won't be any puns about fretting, because there's a lot of them, and they're all super lame, so I'm going to hold off on that. But what we are going to get into is we're going to get into fretboard selection, fret wire selection, hammering frets versus pressing in frets. We're going to talk about fret ends and how to secure those. We're going to talk about chip out, which is always a dreaded topic. And we're going to talk about glue in your frets or to not put glue in your frets. All of these topics and a little bit more... So let's go ahead and get right into it. So let's talk about the material that you're going to use for the fretboard. If you're new to guitar building, I really want to push you in the direction of just very orthodox within the luthier community choices, like ebony or rosewood. There certainly are many choices you can use. Ebony and rosewood are just very good common choices for a number of reasons. They don't need to be finished, so you can have that unfinished surface as your playing surface. And they have the requisite density and hardness that you would want in a fretboard. That hardness is especially important because it's a playing surface, so it's it's really a wear surface. A surface that can degrade over time as you play on it and sweat on it. If you look on wooddatabase.com, Gaboon Ebony has a Janka hardness of 3,080 foot-pounds. Of course, that's averaged amongst however many samples of ebony that they've tested this for. But that's the kind of hardness that we're looking at for uh, our playing surface material. There are other dense hardwoods that would work equally as well as ebony and rosewood. Like, I think Catalosh is actually a fine example To keep things simple, I'm not really going to get into the wide variety of woods you can use here because I I don't think it's helpful. Just as a case in point, I happen to be working on a guitar at the moment which is going to have a zebra wood fretboard. And it's actually not a very good choice for a fretboard wood, but I'm doing that knowing that it's a bad choice. And um, I just really desire other things about the wood, particularly the way it's going to look as a shiny, finished fretboard. Sometimes it's fun to step outside the box and build something that's just plain unusual in that regard. But anyway, let's stick with ebony or rosewood for the rest of this discussion here. And you can use quarter sawn or flat sawn wood for this, but quarter sawn is definitely preferred. And this is for the sake of stability. So most of the stability of your neck is coming from the neck wood itself. So you want to use something good like Honduran mahogany, which is very stable. But the fretboard being attached, glued to the neck, it actually becomes part of the neck. So it influences the neck to some degree. So really the the preferable thing to do is to go with quarter sawn, but some people do choose to use flat sawn simply because given a certain exotic looking piece, that cathedral figure can look really cool. And now the other thing you got to figure out is your fret wire. So there's actually a lot of options here. Uh, As far as the material itself, there's only three, or at least only three that I'm aware of. Maybe there's, you know, some other new materials on the market. But as far as I'm aware, there's nickel silver, which is the most common. There's Evo Gold, which is the fret wire that I personally really like. And then there's stainless steel. And in that order that I just described them, they increase in hardness. So nickel silver is very soft fret wire. So if you ever played a guitar where you get those pits in the frets, uh, it's probably 
nickel silver fret wire or it's just an incredibly old guitar because Evo Gold and stainless steel are very dense and they don't wear like that. So if you value not having to do refrets or anything like that in the future, just use a harder fret wire. Now I like Evo Gold because it's right in the middle between the hardest fret wire, stainless steel, and the soft fret wire, nickel silver. And I feel like that middle hardness is like the Goldilocks zone there because stainless steel to me is, is fine, it's great, but it's almost too hard. It just wears on your tools, it's difficult to work with, and the Evo Gold just seems hard enough. I'm not getting pits in the frets either way, whether I'm using Evo Gold or the stainless steel. So I just settle for the Evo Gold, knowing that it's going to wear just fine. It's called Evo Gold because it has a gold color. It's, that's not an optional color, and it's not a gold plating that's on the outside that's going to you know, come off when you do your fret work. That would be unfortunate. It's actually gold all the way through because it's a copper alloy, and, well, my understanding of metal kind of breaks down at that point, but it, it's gold. It's truly gold in its essence, gold-colored. There's no actual gold within it. So if you are using it, you might want to, um, aesthetically, you might want to switch your hardware out for gold hardware instead of chrome-colored hardware, just to have that consistency across the instrument. The disadvantage of Evo Gold is that it doesn't bend well. It's too brittle. It, it tends to kink or break. Nickel Silver, on the other hand, will bend very easily. And so if you put it in a fret bender... You can bend it to the radius that you plan on using, or to a slight over radius. With the Evo Gold, it comes at, with a pre-radius on it from the factory, and you just have to make that radius work with whatever radius of the fretboard that you're using. Installing Evo Gold frets, therefore, can be a little bit more difficult. So for a new builder, it might be wise to just stick with the tried and true nickel silver fret wire but for the veterans out there the veteran guitar builders if you haven't used evo gold yet and you've been using nickel silver give it a try um, i think you're really going to like it it's definitely been an improvement for me now aside from the material for fret wire you're going to also have to decide on the size of the fret wire and if you've looked at some of the fret wire that's available out there you'll notice that there's a lot of different dimensions that are listed when you're looking at size. There's the crown height, there's the width of the fret wire, there's the tang. The uh, thickness of the tang is particularly important because it has to match the either handsaw or table saw blade that you're using to cut your fret slots. Or if you're using, if you're purchasing pre slotted fretboards, then you have to make sure that those slots match the fret wire that you intend to use, specifically the tang, the thickness of the tang of that fret wire. It's very important. And beyond that very important thickness of the tang measurement, the other measurements like how tall the fret wire is or how wide it is, uh, that's really up to you. Some people like really narrow, small, short fret wire, specifically people who like that Martin feel. I happen to like the opposite, which is very tall, wide fret wire, jumbo fret wire. I just like the feel of it. Not to mention, if you're going to be doing fret levels, which you know, over time you can expect your guitar to receive a fret level, you don't want to start out with your fret wire short to begin with. So at the very least, I wouldn't pick the, the shortest available fret wire. I would pick something in the middle. I happen to pick very tall fret wire. One, because I like knowing that this instrument can receive a lot of fret levels and still be fine without having to pull all the frets and refret the whole thing. And two, I actually like the feel of tall fret wire. But that's just me. It, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. Now, here's a little tip for newbies. I would select the widest fret wire that you can. That's the, the width of the, the crown, not the width of the tang, because... As a newbie, you're going to be making mistakes. You're probably going to get a little bit of chip out on the board or something like that. And the very wide fret crown will actually cover up 
uh, a lot of that chip out that you're likely to get as a newbie. It's a great way to hide your mistakes, and you might find that you actually like the wide fret wire in the end anyway. So that's that. That's your fret wire selection. Uh, but I wouldn't overthink any of that except, you know, just to repeat one more time, that um, one dimension for the tang, the thickness of the tang. Everything else, the crown dimensions, don't overthink them. Okay, so next thing I want to talk about is hammering versus pressing the frets. Or do we do a combination of both, which I'll talk about that a little bit later. But generally speaking, there are two ways to install your fret wire. There's hammering the frets in with a brass, usually a dead blow, a small brass dead blow hammer. And then there's pressing the fret frets in. And there's several different types of fret presses out there on the market. There are the stationary uh, types of fret presses where you feed the fretboard underneath the fret press. This would be a, a fretboard uh, that's not yet installed on the neck or on the body of the guitar. Or there are the f- types of fret presses like the Jaws 2 that Stu Mac sells, which I have. I, I like using those, where you are pressing the frets um, over the neck. So the fretboard is already glued down to the neck and even on, and the neck is attached to the body. So the, the fretboard is in place where it's going to end up and you're using the fret press in that way. Now, all of these methods are going to work, but it's highly dependent on, one, whether or not you're doing this as a kit build, so whether or not your fretboard is already prefabricated to a certain extent for you, that's going to close certain doors, and two, just what your overall process is anyway. So it's really hard to have a complete discussion on whether you're going to be hammering or pressing without knowing you and knowing exactly what your process is going to be, um, whether you're starting with a pre-radiused fretboard, and that goes back to, you know, the question of is it a kit, or are you starting from scratch? So certain methods like the stationary fret press can only be done with the fretboard off of the guitar. However, if you install your frets before you attach the fretboard to the neck and then to the the neck to the body, what you almost invariably end up with is a hump at the 14th fret. And then most people solve this problem by leveling the frets afterwards. And that's fine, but in my opinion, and this is just, you know, my view, I'm, I'm sure there are builders who do it this way, fretting first and then attaching it, and they have a certain particular process where it actually you know, works out fantastic. But in my opinion, I don't think that's ideal to fret off of the body and then have to deal with that, that hump that you get at the 14th fret. Um, with the leveling beam on your fret wire. I think the the right way of doing it, against, you know, there could be someone who you're welcome to disagree, but the, I think the right way to do it is to actually level and radius the fretboard in place, meaning glue it down without the frets, without the radius, just a slotted board, and then give it that radius, which whatever sort of hump you get at the 14th fret from gluing down that unradiused board, it would be leveled out during the radiusing process, which would be done after the neck and fretboard are attached to the body. Now, if you've already radiused and fretted that board before you even glued it down, you've closed the door on that possibility of leveling out the 14th fret hump in the board. So now you have to level it out of the fret wire itself, which gives you uh, short, wimpy frets, which we kind of talked about earlier, um, which I don't like, but some people some people are fine with. So I, I don't want to push people, especially beginners, into an, a very specific um, narrow slot as to as far as their options as to what they can do with this. So that's that's the way I always think of this, and I think 
as you progress as a builder, this is the direction that I think uh, the preferable direction that most people should go towards, you know, away from that fretting off the body method. However, I understand that in, for some people just getting started out, it's ideal. Especially if you're building from kits, you just have to do it that way because you're starting out with a pre-radius fretboard. You have no other option. So the stationary fret press is personally out for me, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's very serious, um, or at least who's very serious you know, right now at the moment. Maybe you plan on getting serious later. I prefer to do all of my fret work over the body after the fretboard is attached to the neck and the neck is attached to the body. That way the foundation, which is the fretboard, can be dealt with before we install the fret wire. By the way, this is the method that I show in my online course. So if you, any of you guys are members of that course, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The course is called Building an OM Acoustic, and it's on my website, ericshaferguitars.com. So now that I've probably sufficiently scared you away from fretting off of the body, I'm going to pull things back a little bit and actually talk about the pros of fretting off of the body, because there are some pros. Uh, the big one is that it's easier. So for the newbies, it might actually be a good idea to fret off the body, just because the technique you use for installing the frets might not be that great yet, and it's certainly easier it, it simplifies things and reduces the amount of tooling that you need to fret off of the body, which is why so many people do it. So I don't want to be the you know crusty old man who says that's the wrong way to do it. You can't do it that way. It's a fine way for someone who you know doesn't have a huge budget to spend on extra tools because it does require a little bit of extra tooling to fret over the body, at least to do it well. Or the person who is working from a kit, in which case you have to fret off of the body. So I don't want to beat that dead horse any more than I already have. So to glue or not to glue, that's going to be uh, the next thing I want to talk about here. That's a, a common question in the community. Some people put glue into their fret slots. Other people do not put glue in their fret slots. There isn't really a right or wrong way here. I prefer to put glue in my fret slots. I use CA glue because I can just wick it into the fret slots. But some people will put hide glue, um, maybe even tight bond into the slots before they hammer them in, which can be a little bit tricky. It adds a, an extra thing that you have to worry about. and It leaves a little bit of mess you have to deal with. So if you're just getting used to the process of hammering in frets, you might want to just try it maybe even just with a practice board without the glue, just to get used to the process before you start doing it, because it's not required that you add glue to the fret wire, but I do think it's a good preventative, especially with pesky fret ends. There's a tendency for the fret ends, the very end of the fret wire, to come up slightly uh, either over time or often even immediately after you've hammered in your frets. There's barbs along the tang of the fret wire, and depending on where those barbs fall after you've cut the fret wire to length, there's often a tiny portion of the very end of that fret wire that is barbless. And so it doesn't actually grab and bite down into the wood, and it actually sits up just a little bit. If you sight down your fretboard after you've fretted it, you might see a couple of these with just a tiny little hairline gap at the end of the fret wire. The way that I personally like to deal with this is I hammer in all my frets. And again, I'm doing this over the body, but I'm not going to beat that horse again. Um, I hammer in all my frets, and then I press them. I like to use the Jaws 2 fret press because that can work over the body. And when I press the frets in after I've hammered them, I do it with a call in the press that has a slightly greater radius than my fret wire. Um, slightly more curved, which actually, uh, that's actually a smaller radius technically. The number is lower. So a more curved call, which is going to target specifically the ends of the fret wire rather than the middle of the fret wire. 
So I'm actually targeting those pesky fret ends, and then I'm running, wicking that CA glue in there so that when I remove the fret press, it's going to hold the fret wire um, in place, specifically where those fret ends are. Now there's a whole process to doing this so that you don't make a big whopping mess out of the CA glue, because CA glue, specifically the water thin stuff, can really get messy on you. And I'm not going to get into the hyper specifics of that process. Um, I do teach it in my online course, but it just suffice it to say that clamping those fret ends down and then wicking in some glue is a good thing to do. And now let's talk about the dreaded chip out. Dun dun dun. So chip out is something that occurs when the when you're hammering in your frets and you usually you make a mistake, you hit one side of the fret wire and the other end pops back up. And as that fret tang is exiting the fret slot, it can catch on the side of that slot and pull up a piece of wood with it and just chip it off. Now we all hate this. Nothing is more universally hated than chip out. And yet, we still use ebony fretboards even though that material is especially conducive to chipping out. It's very brittle material. But we still use it, still love it for its other properties. Now there are two ways to mitigate this problem of chip out. One is obvious, it's just good fret installation technique. As you get better at it, um, you just won't have the ends of the fret wire popping out anymore, and so you won't get that. The other way of mitigating this problem is to just take a triangular needle file and file a slight bevel into each fret slot so that instead of being a 90 degree edge um, on that fret slot, you'll have an angle to it so when that tang, the tang of the fret wire, when it's traveling up and out of the fret slot, it's less likely to catch on an edge that's not this sharp 90 degree edge, right? So just file a subtle bevel into each fret slot. Even if you don't have any problems because your technique is really good, your uh, whoever the repairman down the road who is, has to pull out those frets is going to thank you because when you're pulling out the fret wire, if it doesn't have that beveled edge on it, then it's more difficult to get that fret wire out without getting chip out. And so I think I covered all of my bases here. That was everything I wanted to talk about today. Do realize that this podcast, I do this to... Um, I'm, so I'm always speaking to two different audiences at once. I'm speaking to the guys who have been doing this for a while and I'm speaking to the new builders or the prospective new builders and I just want to say for those new builders out there we got into some stuff today that was a little bit more advanced and I don't want that to um, paralyze you don't worry about a lot of that detailed stuff just pick up some of the basics that I talked about and as you move along, some of that stuff, if you circle back around to this podcast and listen to it later, it'll start to make a little bit more sense if it didn't make sense already. If you enjoyed this and you learned something here, please subscribe and leave a review on whatever platform that you are enjoying this on at the moment. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericshaferguitars.com or you can register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania. Bye for now.